So we're going to continue talking about postoperative fever here, and we're going to address DVT and pulmonary embolism. And I want to preface this by saying that with DVT and pulmonary embolism, the fever, if it is present, and it's not always present, is a low-grade fever. And that sets it apart from uh, most of these other ones, uh, atelectasis, pneumonia, UTI, surgical site infection, and most drug fevers, in that with those, you tend to have higher grade fevers, 101, 102, 103 even. With DVT and pulmonary embolism, which of course a pulmonary embolism stems from a DVT, the fever is low grade, around 100.4 to 100.9, or maybe even slightly below 100.4. So in that four to eight day period when the patient is at risk for a DVT, or pulmonary embolism, if they have a really high fever, like 102, 103, you should really be suspicious of possibly uh, a, an infectious source, like a UTI or a wound infection, or possibly even fevers from any of the possible drugs that you may be giving them. So uh, it's, of course, it's a possible cause of postoperative fever, but it's a cause of postoperative low-grade fever with uh, this specific category. All right, we'll, we'll talk about DVT, we'll talk about pulmonary embolism. The two are uh, inextricably linked. They're both manifestations of venous thromboembolism. You have to have a DVT in order to get a pulmonary embolism. And then we'll also talk about superficial thrombophlebitis. That's not associated with fever, but it's important to address because it's, uh, it's a medical complication. Um, that appears like DVT, but you have to be able to differentiate it out. The USMLE loves to give questions on superficial thrombophlebitis, uh, so we'll talk about that. And then we'll go over some clinical strategies in how to prevent DVT and pulmonary embolism. Now, there are risk factors for DVT, and if you remember risk factors from DVT, and I addressed DVT in the pulmonary section when I talked about pulmonary embolism, uh, the risk factors include surgery, but of course not all surgeries are alike. So the number one surgery that's associated with DVT is orthopedic surgery, and the reason, of course, is that Patients who get orthopedic surgery, namely lower extremity orthopedic surgery, are not able to ambulate afterwards. So if you had orthopedic surgery of the hand, that's probably going to be quite low risk. So we're not talking about all orthopedic surgeries here. But if you have orthopedic surgery of the lower extremity, let's say a knee replacement, hip replacement, or some kind of a uh, femoral nailing, then uh, you're uh, in that higher risk category. So it's mostly, does the surgery uh, affect your ability to ambulate? So orthopedic surgery is the one that's most commonly associated with DVTs. Next would be major general surgery or OBGYN surgery. That's into 15 to 30% risk of DVT. Neurosurgery, around 23%, and then vascular surgery, around 21%. And then, of course, there's other surgeries uh, that uh, I didn't put on here, probably a little bit lower. So these are the, the major ones. And it's going to be influenced by a lot of factors. So most of these are ranges. These were just based on studies that I could find online. But important to know uh, that it, orthopedic surgery is the most risky for uh, putting you at risk for DVT. Um, and it's going to be based on whether or not you can ambulate. So with deep venous thrombosis, the uh, history for these patients are going to be the presence of risk factors for DVT. So a known or unknown history of thrombophilia, cancer, which puts you at a hypercoagulable state, heart failure, the use of contraceptives. So estrogen increases your risk of, uh, of coagulation. If you're overweight, if you smoke, and then an age greater than 60, your risk starts to go up. And then of course the type of surgery, which I uh, alluded to earlier. The symptoms and physical findings with deep venous thrombosis, now I want to preface this by saying that not all DVTs are symptomatic. Uh, so you don't always have symptoms, but the more severe DVTs 
uh, are symptomatic. And what you're going to see is leg swelling of the leg that's affected uh, by the DVT and then pain, tenderness at that leg. You'll also see warmth and edema of the skin over the leg. Uh, the edema will be bad enough to where you'll see pitting. There is a specific sign that you'll notice called home in sign. And what all you do here is you dorsiflex the patient's foot and that's going to cause pain over the calf. And then as mentioned, a low grade fever around 100.4 plus or minus maybe half a degree. How do we diagnose DVT? Well, there's two different ways you can diagnose this based on your clinical suspicion. Most of patients who are surgical post-operative patients are going to be in the high suspicion category because surgery is so associated with DVT because most of the patients aren't walking around much. Um, if there's a clinically low suspicion, and I'll denote uh, how you can separate out low suspicion and high suspicion. If you have a very low suspicion but there are some symptoms present, you can get a D-dimer level, especially if the patient is quite stable. And a D-dimer level is a, uh, will give you a more specific uh, sign as to whether uh, there's inflammation going on. Um, of course, a high D-dimer. If the, you have a clinically high suspicion, which you would in most post-operative patients who have DVT signs, you're going to go straight to sonography. And the treatment for DVT is low molecular weight heparin or just regular unfractionated heparin. Uh, usually, though, we give low molecular weight heparin before the surgery as a prophylaxis. So this is the lower extremity venous circulation, and uh, I want to mention also here that primarily DVTs occur in the lower extremity, about 90% or more. So you have your common iliac vein, splits into the external and internal iliacs, turns into the femoral vein once it crosses the inguinal ligament, femoral goes to deep femoral and it continues on to the lower extremity. Okay, so this is what the thrombosis actually looks like. So when you have a thrombosis, it's not like some little tiny pebble of a, of a thrombus. It's actually a long cord of, of, of thrombosis. So these are quite long. And this is just pulled straight out of a vein, uh, off of probably off of a cadaver. So this is what they look like. Now, I mentioned before that the primary treatment is prevention. And we do prevention by giving the patient either low molecular weight heparin, uh, primarily what's used most commonly in my uh, experience is enoxaparin, Lovenox. Uh, you can also use uh, Fondaparinux. There is also uh, just regular old heparin that you can give, but most physicians, most surgeons like to give the low molecular weight heparins, which are uh, administered subcutaneously. There's also the factor 10A inhibitors, which are uh, rivaroxaban, uh, known as Xarelto, apixaban, which is known as Eliquis, and dibigatran, which is known as Pradaxa. Compression stockings are usually used in adjunct to the uh, low molecular weight heparin. And then ambulation as soon as you can after the surgery, as soon as it's healthy, um, you should ambulate as, as soon as possible. So make sure that the patient isn't just lazing around in their bed. They should be getting up and moving uh, as much as possible. All right. So pulmonary embolism. Uh, now, this is a complication of DVT. And the history behind pulmonary embolism patients are that they're immobilized, they're post-operative, uh, they have hypercoagulability, and this can be either inherited hypercoagulability, like factor V Leiden, uh, or an acquired hypercoagulability, such as patients who are on uh, estrogen-containing oral contraceptives or uh, hormones for other reasons. Uh, hormones for other reasons would include women that are postmenopausal who take estrogen to uh, abate some of their symptoms. Now the symptoms of pulmonary embolism 
oftentimes you have the uh, symptoms of DVT that are present. However, you can have a silent DVT that re results in pulmonary embolism, in which case you wouldn't have any symptoms of DVT. And that happens in about 30% of patients. So 70% of patients do have signs of DVT, but 30% of patients won't. So in that case, you're only going to have signs of pulmonary embolism. And so it's going to be really important, especially during that roughly four to eight day period, uh, to, uh, to make sure that you're looking for these uh, for, for these possibilities. Uh, now with pulmonary embolism, the most common symptom that you see is tachycardia. Tachycardia, or sorry, tachypnea. Tachypnea happens in 96% of patients. So this is the most common symptom in pulmonary embolism, tachypnea. Tachycardia is also seen quite commonly. Uh, that happens in about 44% of patients. And then, this pleuritic chest pain uh, is also something that's quite common. And this pleuritic chest pain is uh, usually comes on quite, uh, quite quickly. So patients will describe a sudden onset of pleuritic chest pain. And remember, pleuritic chest pain is chest pain when you breathe. So it's, it's abated by keeping your uh, diaphragm still, and it's made worse by taking deep breaths in. Uh, tachycardia is seen in about 44% of patients, and then uh, elevated jugular venous pressure uh, or jugular venous distension uh, is also seen quite commonly. So why do all these happen? Well, when we're talking about a pulmonary embolism, you have your, uh, you have your, your emboli traveling up to the heart and getting lodged in passing through the right atrium, right ventricle, getting lodged into the uh, pulmonary circulation. When you have a blockage, it increases the pressure backwards. So you're gonna have pressure pulled backwards onto your right atrium, right ventricle, and then through the rest of your venous circulation. So uh, you'll have an increased right atrial pressure, increased right venous pressure, and then pressure in, increased pressure in your, uh, in your veins. And that will include, notably, the jugular vein. So that's why you have the elevated jugular venous pressure. Hemoptysis may be seen also in uh, really severe cases, too. So the, the ones to really remember are tachypnea and tachycardia. And some other things that you can see, and you don't necessarily need to remember these, but uh, it's, it's good for clinical practice. Uh, diaphoresis, not really specific. Uh, you may hear uh, a louder S2 sound, and that's just because since you're pumping against a higher pressure gradient in, in, the, uh, in the, pul the pulmonary arteries, the right heart is going to have to work harder to, to press, press through that, that higher gradient. And so you may hear a higher, uh, a stronger, louder S2 sound. All right, uh, for diagnosis, there's no one single definitive test for pulmonary embolism. Usually the best initial test is a spiral CT. However, the most accurate test is pulmonary angiography, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do that test simply because a lot of patients who have pulmonary embolism are in uh, emergent situations and this test can take some time to do. Um, so. Pulmonary angiography is most accurate because you're actually going to be able to look at your vessels and see where that blockage is. However, usually the best initial test is a spiral CT. Chest x-ray is sometimes used as an initial test, but frequently it's normal in pulmonary embolism. So you can't use a chest x-ray to uh, rule out pulmonary embolism. All patients with pulmonary embolism should get anticoagulation if they're not already, and so that's going to be low molecular weight heparin or heparin, and they should be getting this anticoagulation while the testing is pending. And that primarily is uh, in regards to non-surgical patients, patients who aren't getting low molecular weight heparin uh, to begin with. So I like to use Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism just because it's, uh, it gives you sort of this numerical, statistically validated format to think of pulmonary embolism and to uh, guide your clinical judgment. Uh, 
So with surgical patients, it's generally pretty easy how we're going to approach them. Uh, with surgical patients, they've all had surgery in the last four weeks, so that's one and a half points right there. Um, and if they're already having DVT symptoms, then that's another three points, and that right there puts them into the pulmonary embolism likely category, which is greater than four points. So this Wells criteria approach takes uh, a, uh, with the dichotomous approach takes uh, it, these points, and then if the points are more than four, pulmonary embolism is likely. If the points are less than four, pulmonary embolism is uh, unlikely. So here are our criteria, and the first is DVT symptoms, which, remember, occurs in 70% of pulmonary embolism patients. So if you see DVT symptoms, which could be uh, just tenderness over the calf, over the thigh, redness, home and sign, and so forth, uh, then that's going to be three points right there. If pulmonary embolism is number one on your differential diagnosis, that's going to be three points there. If you have tachycardia, which is very, very frequent, um, see it in about half or more of pulmonary embolism patients, that's one and a half points. If the patient is immobilized, which again, with surgery, they frequently are, uh, or if they've had surgery in the last four weeks, that's going to be one and a half points. If they have hemoptysis, that's one point, and if they have cancer, uh, that's another point. So you add these all together, Pulmonary embolism is likely if it's greater than four, unlikely if it's less than four. Certainly you don't have to memorize this for the USMLE. It can be useful in clinical circumstances to uh, commit these to memory, but for the USMLE, it's good to remember what the risk factors are, not necessarily what the points are. But for post-surgical patients, you're pretty much already uh, going to be going to the pulmonary embolism likely category, just because, especially if they have DVT symptoms uh, to begin with. Okay, so what does this likely and unlikely category mean for us as far as what we do for the patient? Well, if they're less than four or equal to four and they're unlikely, then you get a D-dimer. And the D-dimer is going to determine whether or not you do any more testing. If the D-dimer is normal, you can pretty much rule out pulmonary embolism. If it's high, then you're going to go ahead and get a helical CT. And a helical CT would be what we would also do if the patient were in the likely category, which is, like I said, most post-surgical patients, if not pretty much all post-surgical patients who have pulmonary embolism symptoms. And so for those patients, we get a helical CT. So that's why I say most of the time, the first test you're going to go after is helical CT. However, if it's a post-surgical patient for one reason or another that just doesn't seem likely to have a pulmonary embolism, then in limited circumstances, the D-dimer would be your first test. So we get a helical CT. If uh, the findings are normal, then you can consider alternative diagnoses. If it's indeterminate, then you can get a traditional PA view, uh, just a chest x-ray uh, of uh, the lungs, or you can get a VQ scan. I would opt towards the VQ scan. If you have positive pulmonary embolism symptoms, which you usually should have, if you have Wells criteria greater than four, uh, then you're going to treat the patient for pulmonary embolism.